uh, so it breaks, I'll pick up a dozen more for a nickel at a yard sale. Now, I am not saying that you are valueless at all. You are infinitely valuable to God. But our function is not to sit around looking good and to reflect just all these positive rays of correct theology. We're supposed to live out the theology. We're supposed to be available to God every day in every way for whatever. Feed the dog on this plate? Well, you know, that's what you do with it. You do. And you don't tell people. You just run it through the dishwasher. But we are God's instruments. Scripture is full of that kind of language. And, and we need to make sure we get that right. Well, some people go, well, you know, the whole point of me being this piece of china is because people are going to look at me and go, wow, if that's a Christian, I want to be one of those. John, can we have the other uh, cartoon up here? Oh, look who's here. God's gift to warthogs. You know, I think, I think when we're at our best, we're still sort of, Warthogs, okay? No offense, and we aren't talking about Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, we're, we're talking about these. You know, we may think we are pretty stellar, we are pretty stunning, and we're just going to walk around and God rays are going to emanate out from us. But you know what? There are a lot of nice people in the world, and there, there are a lot of kind people in the world, and there are many other people who smile and open doors. If people are going to know ours has anything to do with, about Jesus, we're going to have to say it. And then we've exposed ourselves as Christians, so we, we better not just open the door. We better help out the person with a flat tire in the rain. We, we better not just uh, you know, put up a little Jesus sort of platitude on our uh, desk. We, we better be willing to listen to the person whose family's falling apart and one of their kids uh, is getting divorced and another of their kids is uh, uh, dealing with a, a life-threatening illness. We've got to flourish, and we've got to care, and sometimes it's really hard. That's why the scriptures talk about denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. I used to get an email uh, from a guy whose tagline down at the uh, sign-off part said, when some people say they want to serve God, they mean in an advisory capacity. <laughs> And, and I think a lot of us are there. Okay, God, you need somebody to serve you? Hey, show me my desk. I'll start writing up some policies for you right now. But serving God means saying, here I am. What do you need today? In the early days of Christianity, Christianity grew like wildfire. Christianity spread to the ends of the known universe within 40 or 50 years. How did it do that? By flourishing and caring. The, the, the people wanted to reproduce. The people wanted to, to, to make as many Christians as they could, but also they knew that this involved care. Um, one of my favorite writers, I've mentioned this book here before and I've uh, spoken, a guy named Rodney Stark. And if you need a favorite sociology of religion, sociologist of religion, choose him. Uh, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, How the Obscure Marginal Jesus Movement Became the Dominant Religious Movement in the Western World in a Few Centuries, that's quite a title, he talks about how Christianity grew because people were out evangelizing you know, on the streets. But he also talks about how it grew because it was a rough world back then. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. When, when people got sick, they, they didn't know about germs, they didn't know about antiseptics and so on. So if somebody got sick and then somebody next door got sick and they lived in cramped conditions in the Roman Empire and somebody else got sick, they declared an epidemic and everybody who could left town. They, they left town. They, they, they went out and um, you know, lived with people on farms and so on. They abandoned whole cities so that people could either get better or die except for the Christians. The Christians took the stuff Jesus said about caring for the sick really seriously, and they stayed in town. And they took care of people. And believe it or not, an awful lot of nursing to this day is still things like making sure people are warm enough, making sure people are cool enough, making sure people are hydrated, making sure people are cleaned up of bodily uh, fluids and so on. And, and the Christians did that. And a lot of the people that the Christians cared for got better. And, and people praised God, and people who had been cared for by the Christians became Christians. And also, they didn't understand anything back then about inoculations and so on. But by the exposure to the various diseases, 
the Christians became more resistant to other diseases. And some people became Christians who said, if you become a Christian, you're sort of a superhuman. You don't catch disease anymore. That just came about because they exposed themselves to the other uh, things that were going on. And the Christians became known as the people who literally would lay down their lives for other people. And in a world where people died young and often died violently, people said, I, I want some of that action. A few weeks ago, uh, the, the columnist, I don't know what she does, she, her name gets around a lot, Ann Coulter, uh, got a lot of press when she was talking about uh, Dr. Bartley, uh, or Brantley, excuse me, Kent Bar Brantley, who had been over in West Africa caring for Ebola uh, patients, and, and he became ill with Ebola. And she said, how idiotic do you have to be to go to a place where people are dying of a disease like that? How idiotic? As idiotic as all of us should be. As idiotic as Jesus called us to be. As idiotic as it is to not go with uh, contemporary standards of personal safety and, and, and self-concern and to simply do what Jesus called us to do, no matter what risks that entails. All right, the business. The business plan is to flourish and to care. How do we know what we're supposed to do? I'm talking in big principles here. Well, some of this stuff's going to sound, you know, maybe a little cliched, but if you take it seriously, it's not. The first thing is simply read our policy manual. Yes, that's right, the Bible. Read the Bible. Heard it, been there, done that, verse a day for the last 27 years. Well, that, that may be the problem, because the Bible is not a treasure chest of individual promises. The, the, the Bible is a plan, and excuse me, so we've got to read some big chunks. If you want to know what the business, the main thing is, just start reading Mark. And when Jesus says, follow me, he shows them what God had in mind in Genesis when God said to flourish and to care. And, and I mean, they, they attracted so many crowds. I, I don't know, <laughs> and for anybody who wants to buy a boat, this may be your excuse. Jesus had a boat. They had to have a boat so they could keep sailing back and forth across the lake because the crowds kept getting too big. Why did the crowds get too big? They say, that's Jesus. He's so funny. He was, but uh, he... His people did the things they needed. They, they, they took care of people, and that attracted people. Oh, Dave, aren't you talking about the social gospel? Okay, no, no, no. Back in the 19th century, there were some people who decided they didn't really believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And therefore, they didn't feel that they should tell people, hey, unless you follow Jesus, you're going to have a really, really negative time after you die. And, and so they just said, well, let's take the other part of Jesus. And let's, uh, let's feed hungry people. Let's do the stuff Jesus said to do. We'll just leave out the whole heaven and hell bit. That just seems so judgmental, so negative. And by the late 19th century, there was this whole thing called the social gospel where people were building gymnasiums, but they were not necessarily preaching in them. So... Those of us who come from the heritage of opposing that said, well, we're going to have nothing to do with that. You know, they've, they've got all these liberal arts colleges. We're going to build Bible colleges. They're going to have the social gospel. We're going to have the real gospel. And so what we did was slice off the other side to a certain extent. I talked about what happened in Rome. What happened in America in the first half of the 19th century, when America started really flourishing, was that the people who followed Jesus came out west, and yeah, they preached the gospel. And they built colleges, and they built high schools, and they started mental health institutions. They taught people how to read. They started publishing companies. They, they started coming up with things that would uh, care for people. Okay, the Salvation Army actually started in England, but was uh, readily adopted over here because this was a tool by which we could both flourish and care. We must be very leery about slicing things up. The, in, in a way differently than Jesus did. Jesus never said, yeah, 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 I just five, fed 5,000. That was lame. Now let me preach a sermon. Nor did Jesus say, well, they're still hanging around. I guess I'll say something to them. For Jesus, it was, it was both sides. You feed the people food and you feed the people.